Okay. So in the grand tradition of presentations and demonstrations, the, uh, the mesh node that's on the sort of 15-foot mast outside was working uh, two hours ago, and now it's not. Uh, I was planning on giving you a live demo, but now I won't. In fact, we seem to be in a, a network black hole tonight. I can't, I've, I'm connected to the Wi-Fi, the guest Wi-Fi in the building, and I can just barely get out. It's a basketball game and taking all the way. It's, yeah, it, well, it's hard to say, but whatever it is, the network here is extremely slow tonight. So we're in some sort of network Bermuda Triangle here tonight. So I'll just talk. Lucky you. Um, so as, uh, I think you've all heard about amateur radio mesh networks. There's been a lot of buzz about it recently. It's, it's one, of the, one of the big new things in ham radio. And, um, and this all got started with a, a group of hams in Austin, Texas, who uh, realized that they could make something interesting for ham radio out of old consumer-grade Wi-Fi access points. And, um, and they did some nice uh, work to modify some open source software and, and make it easier to use. Uh, and that was the originally the uh, high-speed multimedia project uh, turned into broadband hamnet. And then uh, some folks from that group uh, wanted to take the project in a, in a different direction. So now there are two projects, the broadband hamnet group, which is largely focused on experimentation with uh, microwave meshes for ham radio, and the uh, AREDN, Amateur Radio Emergency Data Network, which is really focused on production uh, public service and uh, ARIES data networks. And uh, and that's the software that I'm using right now because that's my goal is to, to have a production network up and running. Uh, so there we go, it worked. Uh, I'm just going to recap my design principles. Uh, I think one of the strengths of amateur radio is that there's minimal, minimal central planning. Uh, we're all working to a set of common standards, but we're doing our own thing and, and doing it to, uh, in new and creative ways, and, and I think that's a real strength when it comes to um, to emergency service. Uh, we also have highly distributed deployment. Uh, few or no single points of failure, depending on what service you're talking about. Uh, even if we lose repeaters, we can still communicate, uh, although we depend on repeaters pretty heavily, but we can do without them if we need to. Um, uh, Amateur radio runs on 12 volts, by and large. And, um, and so we have lots of options if the electrical grid is not available to power our equipment. We can do solar, we can do batteries, we can plug into the cigarette lighter on the car. Uh, we can get radios on the air when there's no commercial power. And we can function without the internet. And we're, in addition, very portable. And we expect to, to do portable operations. And Field Day is a great example of, uh, of a, an extremely large-scale portable operation. So uh, my, my goal here all along, and I've been working on, on our local mesh network planning for about a year and a half, my goal all along is to, is to keep the strengths that am amateur radio has always brought to public service and, and emergency communications, but to take advantage of the stuff that people have been doing, the new and exciting stuff people have been doing with mesh networks, and add that on top of it. Um, there are a lot of buzzwords. Uh, the both the broadband hamnet and the AREDN projects uh, use uh, commodity off-the-shelf hardware, which. Uh, is developed and marketed in very large volumes for the wireless ISP market. Uh, these are the folks who provide internet connections to places where you can't get uh, uh, cable internet or DSL from the phone company. And there's a huge chunk of, of the world where neither cable internet nor DSL is available. And your only option is satellite or terrestrial wireless. I'm sorry? And chunks of Albemarle County, where that's your only option. And we've got some wireless ISPs in Albemarle County. Um, and so the, the, the great thing about this wireless ISP gear is that it's cheap, it's extremely reliable, uh, it's weatherproof, it's ready to go. Uh, wireless ISPs operate on a very thin profit margin. They can't afford to be going out and fixing people's uh, premises equipment all the time. So they, they like this stuff that they can install and it just runs for years. And that's a big advantage for us as well. Uh, 
Um, and, uh, and this is all based on uh, something called OpenWRT. It's the open source firmware uh, that now runs on lots and lots of different kinds of hardware and provides uh, incredibly robust capabilities for, uh, for networking, both wired and wireless networking, and uses something called OLSR, uh, which uh, I can't remember what the acronym stands for. You can look it up. Uh, Optimal link state routing, I think, is what it stands for. Um, anyway, that's the mesh protocol. That's the thing that, that watches for, uh, for nodes to appear and disappear and dynamically reconfigures the network based on which devices are present and which devices are absent. Um, there are a bunch of real-world deployments that are being used. This is the deployment in the Seattle area. This is the Puget Sound that you see here. Uh, they have a number of backbone nodes deployed, and the red areas are places where they have coverage. Uh, they've got quite a robust functioning network that they're using for public service events and uh, is available for emergency response when the tsunami comes and Seattle's underwater. Um, this is a lot closer to home. Uh, these are the folks you heard from a few months ago at this meeting. Uh, they're they have quite a few nodes up and running in the capital area uh, and into Pennsylvania and are very interested in linking uh, with other regional deployments and, and, and I'm very interested in linking with them when we have a little bit more up and running. So linking strictly digital comms or is there any traditional like FM voice? Uh, so this, this is the same technology that is used for the internet. And so anything you can do over the internet, you can do over this network, including digital voice. Um, and I'm going to talk about applications in just a minute, and we'll speak directly to that. Uh, this little cluster down here, which is not linked up with the capital area cluster, uh, this is the Culpeper folks, uh, the Culpeper Club. There's a group of folks doing mesh up there. Uh, they actually have more nodes than this. This map is a little bit out of date. They've got, got um, seven or eight nodes up and running uh, at people's houses, uh, talking back and forth amongst themselves. They're really experimenters rather, rather than doing it for public service. Um, this is the theory behind the network that I've designed. The idea, uh, my idea, is to have a three-layer network, uh, a network that's running at microwave frequencies. I'm using, uh, I'm running at uh, a little over 5.9 gigahertz uh, on the, the nodes that I'm using. Uh, those have the advantage of being high bandwidth at those frequencies. Um, you, can, you can have a, a fairly broad bandwidth signal, uh, which means you can get a lot of bits per second through the network. Uh, the disadvantage, of course, at those frequencies, it's line of sight. If you've got a tree in the way, one tree, you're dead. You've lost everything. Uh, no refraction around buildings. No bouncing off buildings, uh, it's line of sight. If, if you can't see the other antenna from, from where you are, you're not going to get a connection. Um, there, is, uh, there are two companies um, that have done a really interesting thing. They've taken uh, a, a standard 2.4 gigahertz Wi-Fi uh, radio, and they've put a transverter in front of it to, to drop it down to the 70 centimeter band. Um, in, and specifically into the amateur radio frequencies. So they're really, they're really targeting this market. And I've got a couple of cards. I've tried them. They work great. And that's a component to the network as well. So that's a mesh, but operating uh, in the 70 centimeter band down all the way down at the bottom where the um, amateur TV allocation, or where the amateur TV stuff is in the, in the band plan. And then the Winlink stuff, uh, uh, the two meter Winlink station uh, and, and uh, radio email are a part of this as well. So the idea is to have uh, several different frequency bands uh, with various trade-offs. Uh, high bandwidth but limited propagation characteristics up in the microwave frequencies all the way down to what we all know really good propagation characteristics at two meters, uh, but very slow. It's not fast, but you've got connectivity almost everywhere in the county. So, uh, and, and in fact, in central Virginia, this is, I'm really doing this for the whole District 3 uh, uh, area in central Virginia. Um, that's a picture of Charlottesville. 
I hope you like it. <laughs> There's something missing. Uh, the node is missing. I thought it was on this map. Uh, so Observatory Hills right here. And, um, and that's where the node, the first node is. Yes, the, stealth, the, the node that we're not talking to tonight. And, and the wind link is up there as well. The W4 UVA uh, UHF repeater is up there. Um, this is all running at the W4 UVA station. And, and it's that way, maybe 100 yards. Um, oh, I know what this slide is. It's a build. Um, so there's a, a really nifty piece of software called Radio Mobile. It's, um, it's free. And um, and it lets you do this this path analysis. So these are uh, these are snapshots. This is a uh, an analysis from the W4 UVA site to the Greene County Sheriff site. Um, and as you can see, fairly low signal strength. So this probably isn't going to work. And this also uh, Radio Mobile makes some assumptions about uh, vegetation, but it doesn't know what kind of vegetation you've got along that path. And, and so if, you know, these, these high spots have trees on them. And so they're getting into this Fresnel zone consider, considerably more than, than you would, uh, than Radio Mobile knows about. So in fact, its predictions are gonna be optimistic. And that's what I've found so far, is that its predictions are optimistic. This is, the, yeah, this is all 5.9 gigahertz. Yeah. Yeah, you get a little, pro little better propagation with 2.4. Um, the problem with 2.4 is that it's a zoo. Um, most people's home routers are in the 2.4 gigahertz band. Uh, lots of wireless ISP in the, the 2.4 gigahertz band. It's very popular for the wire wireless ISP market. Um, it's, uh, plus, you've got all the ISM stuff, the, the medical devices that are unlicensed and and are not supposed to interfere with other services, but they do. Um, and Bluetooth is is in the 2.4 gigahertz band, and so everybody's Bluetooth headset and Bluetooth keyboards and mice, and it's 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 a mess. It's just a mess, and uh, and so I decided not even to fool with that. Um, here we go. This is the one I thought we were going to get. So you can see the, the first node is up at uh, W4 UVA. It's got a 5.8 or 5.915 gigahertz uh, radio. It's also got the Windlink station at, on 145.730 megahertz. And uh, and this is an example of, of Radio Mobile's optimism. Uh, the this is probably the real coverage area over here. And and this over here is some sort of um, hallucination that that the software is having because because there's a mountain right there. there. There's no way there's any coverage on the back side of the mountain. That's just that's just fiction. But the coverage in Charlottesville is pretty good. I went up to the top of the Market Street parking structure downtown. Wonderful connection. Um, I went to the top of the parking structure at Martha Jefferson. Wonderful connection. I uh, went up and bought a donut and, and a cup of cider at uh, at Carter Mountain Orchard. Got a great connection from up there. So, uh, you know, not my house. I, I can't get anything from my house, but I'm not surprised. Uh, I didn't think it was going to work, but I had to try. So do you have to, you can buy a USB card you can put in a laptop that will allow you to connect in with this? No. Okay. So, uh, what, what you need is, um, if you're going to connect to the, to the microwave network, you need uh, a radio uh, that does 5.8, uh, that does Wi-Fi in the 5.8 gigahertz band. And in fact, you need one of a fairly limited set of radios like the Ubiquity devices that I'm using. Company, the name of the company is Ubiquity. Um, that uh, can be tuned outside the unlicensed band. And their radios will go um, from a little bit below to a little bit above the unlicensed frequencies for Wi-Fi. Uh, and, and the 5.915 megahertz frequency is outside the, the wireless ISP band. It's, it's in the amateur allocation. So it's a, it's, a, uh, it's a frequency that belongs to us. 
uh, and the wireless ISPs are not supposed to be using it. So you just brought a ubiquity radio and a battery with you when you went to Carter's Mountain? Yeah. Test it out. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, I just put it on a little mass, bungee to the car, and so it was maybe 10 feet in the air. It's an omnidirectional radio or an antenna? Yeah. Uh, there are also directional antennas. You can get Yagi's, you can get dishes, you can get all sorts of different form factors. You just run five or six watts, right? Oh, a lot less than that. Oh, yeah. Very yeah. Um, anything from uh, about a half to, to one watt. And then uh, the Omni antenna that I have up at, at W4UVA is about a 13 dB gain antenna. Um, one of the dishes is more like 25 dB. So. Not at all. Very, very uh, conducive to doing solar powered. Yep. Yeah, they draw very, very uh, little current. So the, yeah. uh, the node that's here at UVA is then hooked into the standard internet there? Is that how that's working? No. Or is it only talking amongst these? Uh, it's, it is not at present connected to the UVA network. It's connected to a private network that has a, a stack of servers running a bunch of services in support of public service and, and ARIES activities. Um, it could be connected to the internet, but it is not right now for a couple of reasons. Um, for starters, I'm not prepared to monitor the usage to make sure that nobody's doing anything commercial. and and and. If you take a strict interpretation, commercial is going to a website that has advertising on it, which virtually all websites do. Um, so, uh, you know, that's... <clears throat> so I'm just not ready, I'm not ready to monitor the usage and, and, and take that into account. Also, uh, University of Virginia, which is where the W4 UVA um, station is and, and the network that I'm connected to uh, has a policy about not bridging uh, to outside networks and uh, and I want to be a, a, a good neighbor a good good player they're they're willing to host this for now and if I violate university policy and connect their network to one that that they don't consider secure they wouldn't be very happy so but all that said in an emergency there's a checkbox. All I have to do is click the box, and 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 the wireless network is connected to the internet. And and I feel certain that in an emergency I would be allowed to do that. Sure. And we we wouldn't worry about the details. No. Um, so we we did a a real quick test at last year's uh, at the 2014 airport exercise. We took two units out there. Uh, we put one unit down at uh, our location next to the crash site, and we put another unit up at the um, up at the uh, the hangar that the the headquarters for the exercise was in, up next to the passenger terminal. And uh, we got them up and and running very very quickly. Didn't take long at all. It took us longer to put the put up the pop up tent than I think I think than it did to get the radio on the air. Um, so they go, they set up and tear down very quickly, um, but we proved to ourselves that line of sight really is the law. You don't have any choice about it because we totally failed to connect the two radios because um, the crash site was was at the exercise area, which is off the north end of the runway and down. I don't know what would you say from the runway down to the exercise. The crash pad is maybe a hundred foot drop, something like that. So. Far too much. Didn't work. Um, I have some ideas about what to do about this. Uh, balloons. You know, you see these advertising balloons all over the place. They can they can lift a fair a fair amount of weight, and um, and so I uh, one of the things that I want to tinker with, and, and in fact I, I I have one of each of those things that you see there. I just haven't had time to put them together and give it a try. But in theory, you ought to be able to loft a a Raspberry Pi or a Beagle Bone or something like that with a with a 5.8 gig USB stick and uh, and a, a nice omnidirectional antenna. These are little omni antennas that are designed for uh, for um, 
uh, for drones, for the video downlink. A lot of, a lot of drones use 5.8 gig band for video downlink. And, um, and so these are nice little antennas. They're about yay long and cheap and pretty effective. Uh, also, I have a friend who flies with Civil Air Patrol. And, uh, and they actually do this in other parts of the country. They fly amateur rep radio repeaters on, on CAP airplanes. And, um, and the local CAP wing is, is willing to, to consider putting a mesh node on one of their planes and loitering over an incident site. You know, go up there and throttle back and circle until they need to refuel and then go back up and do it again so we could have an aerial repeater, basically. So those are some possibilities. Um, what we need right now, in the words of Warren Zevon, is uh, lawyers, guns, and money. Um, I've financed everything in my, out of my own pocket up until now. Uh, my, my wife isn't going to tolerate that any longer. Uh, and, and honestly, we're, we're hampered right now by places to put radios. Uh, for the 5.9 gig stuff, you need to be up. You need to be high, and that's a problem. Uh, I, I think I've talked before about the the challenge with climbing towers. The the cars folks, Dayton, has uh, uh, has given us permission to put one of these radios up on their 150 foot tower at the corner of McIntyre and the bypass, uh, but <coughs> we don't have anybody to climb the tower. I got a bid. It was a little under $1,000 to climb the tower and, and put one of these $200 radios up there. Uh, so uh, that's a real, real problem. Um, we've had uh, a couple of other relatively promising locations that have considered it and, and said no. I think they're worried about liability issues probably. Um, and, uh, and for a full deployment, we're going to need cash. Uh, I'm going to need more, a lot more radios, and uh, uh, like I say, I, I can't keep doing it on my own. Hello. Yeah. Uh, what would be a ballpark number to, uh, to assemble the station at home? Um, at home, uh, if you want to do the the 5.9 gigahertz stuff, uh, uh, an omnidirectional unit uh, is about uh, a little under two hundred dollars. A uh, and that just, what you get for that is an Ethernet jack you plug into a computer. Um, a, a dish, a directional dish, is in the 75 to 100 range. Uh, and, um, and if you want to do the 70 centimeter stuff, that's pricier. That's, that, a station there would be more like four or 500. Uh, it's much lower volume, so you don't get the, the high volume pricing. It's, it's really targeted at the amateur market, so the little radio card is almost, <coughs> almost $300 all by itself. Um, but it's not bad. You know, it's, it's cheaper than a, than a dual band um, FM radio. For the Central Virginia net, are you <coughs> in terms of our club or our club and some surrounding area clubs? Uh, I, am, I am building this for Aries. That's my goal. Uh, is to have a, a network that's available to support th our served agencies, uh, basically the county public uh, uh, public safety uh, so directors, county, police, yeah. fire, and uh, for for all of District Three, which is uh, Albemarle, Buckingham, Cumberland, Fluvanna, and Green. That's does my goal. The have any, does, in other words, if the county needed an antenna, then do they have their own staff, or they contract out with us? Tower climbing services uh, They contract out. Okay. And now the good news is the Albemarle folks are very interested in in this. They they love the idea. It, it would give them a capability that they don't have. Our public safety um, radio system uh, does not have any data capability, and and that's something that they are pretty excited about. As you know, so, I found several tower climbers out of state, but they pay. They traverse through this area all the time. So when we had someone work on our Marshall Mountain antennas, the, our travel cost <coughs> was minuscule. Yeah. Well, we've got we've got companies that that do tower work locally. There there's some in town. There I the quote that I got was from a guy over in um, Waynesboro. 
Uh, yeah, so there are, there are folks for whom travel expenses are not a big, are, are not a, a problem. Subsidized labor cost was like 35 an hour. It's cheap to climb. Okay. Well, I'm looking. I'm looking for ideas. I, I need help with this. Uh, this is not something that I have expertise in. Uh, if you know, I mean, there there are some locations that would be great. The uh, the SNL building downtown would be a great location. Uh, if you have any con connections uh, that you can, any strings you can pull, that would be wonderful. Um, Mont Alto. Uh, I've I've talked with the. The facilities and security folks up at at the uh, Monticello Foundation, the Jefferson Foundation, um, and the the security and and uh, and facilities people up there love the idea, but but they're not willing to take it to the to the board because if they're going to go to the board with a request, it's going to be for something they want, not for something that we want. So if you know somebody on the board at Monticello. Uh, that would be a wonderful location. Uh, you know, if 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 you have contacts uh, at places that are either tall structures or towers, and you're willing to make uh, an introduction, I would love to talk to folks because uh, that's that's what's really killing us right now. A UVA hospital would would be a really good location. And no tower climbing. Yeah, buildings are a great choice. If you've got a tall building, it's a great choice. PVCC is that high enough? Don't know. I'd have to. I'd have to do a simulation on PVCC. Haven't done that. Yeah. So uh, you know, make suggestions. If you've got some place where you can make a contact, uh, send me a note, and I'll plug it into Radio Mobile and see if it's worth pursuing. Uh, like I say, Radio Mobile tends to be optimistic, but it, but it's a pretty good first cut. I can, I can tell whether it's worth talking about. It, it, you know, if it's just a non-starter, then, then we don't have to use any, any influence, uh, expend our influence in that way. What about our own repeater sites? Um, Marshall Manor is problematic, for a lot of reasons, uh, uh, but it. It, uh, it's just not very helpful. Herd would, would be pretty good uh, as a stepping stone to uh, Buckingham and Cumberland and, and Nelson. Uh, it would be valuable for that. Um, uh, Bucks would be a great site, uh, but the tower's full. There's no room on the tower. Now, uh, I started to say that our county folks are very enthusiastic about this and have told me that, that they will plan this uh, into their new tower, uh, which they're in the, in the design stages for right now. They're going to put an, extra to an, an additional tower up at Buck's Elbow. And so when that happens, uh, we should have that as one of the sites, and that would be a really good site. So... Um, Yes, this is my wishful thinking slide. Let's, let's see if we can actually demo anything. And if not, I'll just talk about it. For the network, you know, on tall buildings, towers, are you talking about $5,000 you would need, ballpark $10,000, $2,000? I'm trying to get a feel. So the, the, uh, the quote that I got from Absolutely. for the cars tower, uh, about half of it was the climbing work. So that was a little under a thousand dollars, was nine fifty or something like that, and about half of it was the climbing, and about half of it was the hardware to uh, to dress the cables up the tower and and a standoff at the top to hold the antenna, and you know that stuff adds up pretty quickly. By the time you you're going to the top of a hundred and fifty foot tower, you end up with a fair bit of hardware to to support the cables and. So, and the, so that that's the the crazy thing about this. The radio is two hundred bucks, uh, and, and it costs a thousand dollars to put a two hundred dollar radio so at the top of the tower. Fifteen hundred dollars per installation. Are you thinking about five towers approximately? Something like that. I think if we had had three to five uh, really good locations, high spots with re with really good coverage. Uh, then we could fill in with less attractive locations. Yep. So Mike, if I can get on the water tower in Rutgersville, um, 
can get all that equipment to be placed at the top of the tower, or would we run like Ethernet cable down line down the, to the bottom, or how? Would um, so uh, there are two different ways you can run this. Uh, all you, all, at minimum, what you need is power. Uh, so if you can get um, 110 volts at, I forgot what the number is, it's a, a tenth or two tenths of an amp. It's, it's a very low current draw. Uh, so if, they'll, if they've got power up there already, or if they'll let you, I'm sure they've got power for the lighting, if they'll let you tap into that, uh, you're not going to draw enough to cause them any trouble. Um, if there are radios up there, they, they certain, there's certainly power up for that. And that would, uh, that would allow that node to act as a, a relay in the mesh, basically. It would link up with other nodes that it could see and, would, and could move traffic between other nodes that weren't able to see each other. If you wanted to actually have an internet connection, you'd either have to have one up at the top of the tower or down at the base and run an Ethernet cable down to the base of the tower. Uh, and, but you don't have to have an Internet connection in order to have a useful node. It can be a part of the mesh, and uh, it, even if it's not connected to the Internet. So I'm looking at the, the observatory on the platform and yeah. the water tower. And those would both be great locations. Yeah. Both fantastic locations, and that would get us further north. Uh, if we could get to the, the uh, Blue Ridge Observatory, um, then I feel quite certain we could link up with the Culpeper folks, uh, which which gets us pretty close to the the Northern Virginia mesh. That is an common process. Yeah. Cool. Is so that would be great. Culpeper eventually link up with Northern Virginia. Yeah. Yeah, they're going to do that, or or may may already have. Yeah. Uh, quick question. Um, I've, I've got a cousin who used to work for a power company in Tidewater. He now works up here, and he's a tower climber. Uh -huh. He's interested, but he wants to know what kind of tower is it, and does it have safety cables on it. Okay. So if we get him that information, he may be willing to do it. He used to climb four or 500 foot towers and send me videos of that crazy thing. Yeah. It works for him, but... Yeah. yeah. I, I don't. Uh, I couldn't do it. No, even not. even if, if I were. Give me that info. I'll pass that to him, and he may be interested in, in doing that. I will. I'll be happy to. He loves to climb. They don't let him climb much anymore. So. Okay. Okay. Cool. Thank because, you. Because Thank is, you very much. It's because the stuff is relatively lightweight. It sounds like the actual time at the peak of the tower isn't that long. Yeah, it's it, it, it's probably not a lot of work. And you're putting up an Ethernet cable. It's not like you're pulling one inch hard line and that kind of stuff. It's an Ethernet cable running up, that you're dressing up the tower. So uh, it's not it's not difficult. Um, if I were 20 years younger and 50 pounds lighter, I might do it myself. But but that's not going to happen. Uh, no, Cat five is good for uh, up to 100 meters. The Ethernet spec is 100 meters, so 150 foot tower. I'm sorry. Uh, the car's tower is 150 feet. Yeah, so 150 and another 100 or so to get back in, back to the building and and wind your way through the building to wherever the power outlet is. It's it's well within the Ethernet spec. And I've got well, since we put up the. UVA side, I've got about 900 feet of, of outdoor UV resistant um, shielded cable sitting in, in my garage that uh, that is for this purpose. So for some number of installations, I've already got the cable. Um, I'm going to just click and see if anything happens. See if maybe the network is feeling better than it was earlier. And it's not. Okay. Still not working. Uh, so what was the hardware? <clears throat> I'm sorry? What was the hardware? You're, just, you're, you're trying to go over the internet to it? Or? Yeah, I just connected to the Wi-Fi in the building here. So uh, I brought with me uh, uh, one of these. It's, a, uh, it's made by the company Ubiquity uh, that I've been talking about, one of the big players in the wireless ISP market. Uh, it's an outdoor rated uh, router with a... Uh, 5.8 gigahertz uh, dual, actually 5.8 gigahertz radio in it. 
uh, and it's connected to an omnidirectional 13 dB gain omnidirectional antenna that uh, is dual polarized. So it's got vertical elements and horizontal elements, which gives you uh, much better um, connection over over difficult distances. Uh, and that's on about a 15 foot mast outside the corner of the building there. And that's about under 500 dollars for that. Uh, 200. And you just feed it 12 volts an Ethernet, basically. It's 24 volt DC over the Ethernet cable. Um, <coughs> power injector that you plug one side into the Ethernet cable that goes to the radio, and it, that carries the data connection plus 24 volts DC. And the other side you plug into your computer, and you're talking to the oh, to the box up in the radio. And um, so you don't have to run antenna cables up the tower. You really don't want long antenna runs at these frequencies. The loss is is punishing. Yeah. So the uh, so the feed lines are literally about that long between the radio and the and the antenna. So you run Ethernet up to the to the radio. The radio's up at the top of the tower, right next to the more antenna. Easy to configure for your laptop. Yeah. So one of the one of the de the design goals for for both the broadband hamnet and the AREDN projects is um, to make this accessible to hams who are not network engineers. And so in both cases, it's a it's a set of firmware and a, a set of step-by-step -step instructions for installing that firmware on your device. And and what you end up with is something that requires very, very minimal configuration. You don't have to know anything about networking in order to configure the device. And then it just connects to to other devices that it can see. So, do you so have it's a pretty simple. You can you could connect it to your home network. You have to understand a little bit about networking to connect it to your home network. Mm -hmm. uh, if you just want to plug one computer into it, it's it's kind of no it's a no brainer there. Um, so I've I've uh, I've set up a, a set of servers. I've been pretty fortunate with getting computers donated. And so I've got a set of servers running also up at, at W4UVA right now. My intention is to spread them around and, and get a little bit of physical diversity in the servers. Uh, but I've got uh, something called OpenFire running. It's an open source uh, collaboration system that basically provides what Skype provides. Uh, video conferencing, audio conferencing, text chat. Uh, it does all of the and, and file transfer. It does basic file transfer. I also have a, a another server running that is running something called C file, S E A F I L E. It's an open source uh, Dropbox equivalent. So that provides shared files, um, syncing to to desktop machines. Um, and then I've got a, a something that I'm tinkering with. It's not ready for prime <coughs> prime time yet. Both of those are production services. They're up and running all the time. They work. Uh, we could use them over the internet right now. Um, and, uh, and is that what the emergency responder people want, those, those kinds of services? Uh, this is something that we would use uh, to support our activities. Mm -hmm. uh, the, the police and fire and, and rescue would probably not be using these services. Well, I'm trying to imagine what they want from us mm -hmm. in an emergency situation. We, we will give them a negative. Uh, they want to be able to move data. You know, police cars, they've got, uh, although the, the public safety radio system doesn't have digital capabilities, the police cars around here all have MiFi's in them, you know, little cellular wireless gizmos hooked up to the radio in the car. Uh, if there's a, like, like the airport exercise, simulating a crash, uh, the, the F FAA and the NTSB and VDOT are and VDEM are all going to want video. They're going to want to say, hey, we want, we want some pictures. Send us pictures. Send us live video. Uh, um, the, uh, uh, I can't remember exactly what it's called, but, um, but the state has available for loan to, to local uh, public safety folks um, basically portable 900 megahertz trunk um, sites. It's a a big Pelican case with a 900 megahertz trunk system. It, it needs uh, a data link back to the back to the main trunk system in order to to extend your public safety radio system, and and we could provide that backhaul 
uh, for to set up a local trunk site if, if it were an area that's not well covered by by our system and there are dead spots in, in our public safety system all around the county. So there are a bunch of things that they'd like to be able to do that uh, that they're not able to do right now. Yeah, so uh, so my goal here is has been to get to the point where uh, this can all be managed by one or two people um, sitting in their shacks at home. Because like many of you, if we have an ice storm, I can't get out. Uh, they might they might send a fire truck to pick me up. I don't know. Maybe not. But but it'd be nice if they didn't have to. So I'm building a network that that I can manage from my house uh, remotely and. And in, you know, you could you could imagine that um, that I would provide them with a set of boxes that had a, a radio on one side and an Ethernet port on the other side, and and all they need to do is tell me we need it, turn it on, and I could go tap 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 on the computer in my shack and and make all those ports live, and they can plug anything they want to and in, into them, and we're just providing a private internet. And and so they could, yeah, they could run what they what they needed to run over that. I think Andrew, you were next. Yeah, I know doing the hand of RAM search, you were, you were asking about what the public safety wants. I know that doing the hand of RAM search, they mentioned that the Virginia Communications Cache, which is I think what you were looking for, from the Virginia Department of Emergency Management out of Harrisonburg, came in. Um, and within 15 minutes, half hour, they had an entire uh, trunk radio system set up because they knew it was going to overload our local <coughs> trunk system. Uh, so everything was ready to go. But yeah, so something like that mesh network would have been great for, for any kind of yeah. that or, or backhaul time. Well, they brought in several <coughs> more computers. Of course, they did, the right. coverage did not end up being as good as what we have. Because they, you know, they they came in from several locations, including uh, Fairfax, um, out in like Chesapeake area, where, um, yeah. and um, but the, you know, their locations were you know less than optimal and stuff. And they're not used to this kind of topography. Yeah, and but it, you know, um, but it it is definitely a useful capability. They have yeah. two thousand. Radios distributed around the the state in four caches and four mobile repeater systems, and we had three of them here. Right. So it's a great resource, uh, but if if we have a hurricane come straight through Virginia and knock out public safety radios all over the state, those four those four cache systems aren't going to go very far. Yeah. So I think having our own capability is wise. What happens in a rainstorm or snowstorm? Is that thing gone? And it worked at all. Seemed like it'll be wiped out. Uh, if it, if it were a downpour, you know, the kind of rain where you can't see fifty feet, uh, it, it it might uh, might knock it off the air. But normal precipitation uh, is not a problem with those frequencies. For example, my dish network, and that's at two point four. So right. why it takes an extremely heavy rain. Yeah. Now five gigahertz or some water resonances. Yeah. How about no? Uh, you know, it's possible that a heavy snow would would interfere with it, but uh, but it would probably be a temporary outage. With any of these precipitation events, uh, it would have to be pretty heavy, and and so it would be a temporary heavy rains uh, only last outage. Minutes. Yeah, typically only minutes. A, a normal steady rain isn't going to be a problem. Uh, you put surge arresters on the cat five cables. Yes. Yep. Indeed. So the website was a good first take to see if there's coverage between two points. What what's the second step? You uh, you're talking about the website that uh, I think you sent out the link, right, Dennis? Yeah, that was to, a, a um, simple approach. It didn't have the power. That was strictly line of sight. Right. No power consideration. Tells you where they have line of sight. So the the next step would be to either 
uh, download and learn how to use Radio Mobile and do it yourself, or you could ask me to do it for you. Well, Radio Mobile actually has a topography database, correct? Yes. Uh, that's a big deal. Right. And it, it takes into account the, the specific propagation characteristics at, at particular frequencies, and it computes the Fresnel zone. Does it have man-made you know. like buildings? No. Just no. It, it makes some assumptions about terrain. You tell it, you tell it, uh, are you in the desert? Are you in uh, a temperate climate? Are you in a rainforest? You know, it, it really gross uh, adjustments for vegetation. But it's using a, a real t uh, topo database. So, it, so it, but it knows what the what the. It knows, it knows what ground level is, but it doesn't know anything about vegetation, doesn't know anything about man-made uh, obstacles. It makes some based and it makes assumptions about those, yes. Technology. Right. Yeah, Michael. Oh, so, uh, so this is something that, that is not terribly important at lower frequencies, but when you get to microwave frequencies, um, a, a, fair, a sizable fraction of the energy is actually outside of the line of sight, and that's called the Fresnel zone. And, and the, I'll, let's see. Well, I, I, I remember some diagrams. You get a little bit of bending due to the magnetic field, and it has a fraction. Yeah, so I'm going to... No, actually, it's... it's so... So basically, the, the, each of these lines here, this isn't just pretty decoration to make it look cool like there's energy going here. Um, this is, the, is Radio Mobile computing the, the basic, basically the clear zone that you have to have. This is the line of sight. The red line is the line of sight. But enough of the energy is distributed on either side of that, that straight line between the two antennas that if you have obstructions uh, intruding into that, into that um, zone, it significantly de decreases the amount of energy that makes it to the other end. Why does it come and, back toward the line of sight at either end? I'm sorry? What makes it curve back? You know, that's a good question. I don't know. I'll tell you up on Yeah. If somebody knows, they, they should, uh, they, I'll, I'll hand it over. I don't actually know. Uh, I haven't looked into the physics well, of like it. Well, like a radar signal at S-band, which I'm pretty knowledgeable. Yeah. You know, it doesn't just go straight. There's a little fourth or it, it goes left. Yeah. It goes line of sight and slightly bend well, the Earth's terrain a little bit. But that's, that's a different. Yeah. Uh, that's a different <laughs> phenomenon from the Fresnel. Yeah. But yeah. this is communication from both. Yeah. Right. Right. So, um, I will be happy to research it and be able to explain it at some future meeting. But, but I can't today. Getting a little bit of diffraction because as you go up in altitude, the air becomes thinner, so the end, it's bending a little bit, like Snell's law for light. I'll put something on you. Smells a lot for light. Smells a lot. Oh, that smells. Now you get it, right? Yeah. Oh, smell. Yeah, yeah. We'll, uh, well, I'll, I'll give a report on smell zones at some future meeting. But it's basically bending because we're not operating in a vacuum. We have real atmosphere. That's why you get dust. That's my guess, is that it's something to do with yes. with the, the so fact that it's not a vacuum. When well, yeah. we have an inversion, a radar signal could really bend and follow the Earth's curvature. Yeah. But there's some natural bending. Yeah. I've been retired for two years. I hadn't thought about that. Yeah. But it's also the case that, you know, it's, it's not a point source. <laughs> that, that omnidirectional antenna is about that tall. And uh, and a 5.8 gig 25 dB gish, dish is about that big around, and so it's not a point source, and uh, and that is a part of it as well. Any other questions? Okay.